Good morning. You ready to hear some exciting announcements? Woo! Here comes Joy Cox. Get ready. She's going to be exciting. She's got her Christmas sweater on. Have you packed your, sh have you packed your shoe box yet? Okay. Um, you still have two weeks. If you need to pack another one, there's still some out there. Uh, November 14th is Collection Sunday. That's two weeks from today. Boxes are still available at the display out front. And this year, our church will again be a drop-off location for people and other churches to drop off their shoeboxes next door. And that's where I need your help. Beginning Monday, November 15th, and going through Monday, the November 22nd, will be open a few hours every day, some daytime hours and some evening hours, and I need your help. There's sign-up sheets out here in the hall. I need two or three people each day, and men, you're not excluded. I need uh, the shoe boxes have to be packed in cartons and carried out to the trailer so we could use your help. Every shoe box we pack gives a child an opportunity to learn about Jesus. And I got an update from Samaritan's Purse that says when, when Samaritan's Purse started Operation Christmas Child in 1993, the first year they had a few hundred shoe boxes that they shipped from North Carolina. From that humble beginning, we've come a long way by God's grace. This year, they're expecting to ship the 200, mil 200 millionth shoebox out of the country. <laughs> they began the project not long after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. And in the Ukraine right now, it still feels like the Cold War. But they're making headway, even in towns that have been liberated. Families won't be able to purchase Christmas gifts for their children. There's nothing to purchase. So Operation Christmas Child will step in and distribute to th these families. So be in prayer for all of the people that are going to pack boxes and the children that are going to receive them. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. All right, thank you, Joy. What a great ministry, making an impact. All right, you ready to listen quickly? Three quick announcements. Tomorrow is trick or trunk or trunk or treat or whatever you call that. You can call it either one tomorrow night at the CLC. If you haven't gone out and bought tons and tons of calories and brought them to the church office, do that tomorrow. We could probably use more. Uh, we've got quite a bit, but we could use more always. And then, uh, so that's tomorrow night. If you want to bring your car up here, if you just want to show up and help, you can do that. And then, um, this one is important. That, not that that's not important, but starting this Tuesday on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. until right after lunch at 1 p.m., the sanctuary will be open for people that want to come in here and pray. Okay? So sometimes people just want to come to a safe place, a place of sanctuary, and be able to pray. So this will be open. There will be some music playing softly. And there will be some prayer concerns on the screen, just rolling. So if you need help knowing how to pray, you can come at 10 and stay till 10.15. You can come at 10 and stay till 11. You can come at 10 and stay till 2, whatever you want to do. But it'll be open for you to come by. And we're doing it through lunch because some people want to come on their lunch hour. And so we're, we'll do that from here until the Lord gives us other instructions. Tonight we have uh, committee meetings at 5 o'clock. So if you serve on a church committee... Hope you'll take that seriously and be a part of what's going on at your church. And then at 6 p.m. we have church conference. We are having hamburgers. It's kind of like a tailgate party. And so bring something that goes with hamburgers, vegetables for the burgers or baked beans or whatever you want to bring, chips. Just bring what you want to bring for that, and we will have a great time, and that starts at 6 o'clock. Right now, we're glad that you're here to worship with us. If you're a guest, if you would fill out one of those welcome cards in the pew in front of you and return it to us when we receive the offering. We'd love to know about you. But most importantly, we're glad that you're here to worship our Lord with us. And so let's all stand right now and have a time of welcome.
Isaiah, it says, For I am the Lord your God who holds your right hand, who says, Do not fear, I will help you. We've all been in those situations where uh, those, we call them different things, valley times, whatever you ever call them, where we, we feel like, you know, we're kind of there alone, but the Lord tells us in Scripture that He is there. Do not fear that I will help you. And that's what this first song talks about. It says, In the middle of the storm, I'm holding on to you, so let's worship Him this morning. There's no place that His love can't reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. storm right he's holding on to us that's the grip that won't ever let go because oftentimes we in our strength what do we do we release that grip and let go but he continues to say i'm holding on to you amen that's a reason to smile and rejoice this morning all right There is a river of gladness that flows from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved. That was me. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. The chains of the past are broken.
Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for the love of God that is far greater than our sin. For the love of God that just undoes us. It makes us where we don't even know appropriate words to say. Thank you, Father. Can we just use the ones that you've taught us, Lord. We cry out hallelujah to the Father. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the one who was slain in our place. We bless you, O oh Lord. And not just because you've blessed us, but we bless you, Lord, because we're compelled to bless you as the author and creator of everything we see and experience. Thank you, Father, for that incredible rainbow I saw yesterday. Thank you, Father, for the sweet rain. Thank you, Father, for the reminders that you are the one who's in control of all things. And so, Father, may we just give you as the one true, holy, righteous God all the praise and all the glory that only you deserve this morning. Through our singing, through our giving, through our study of your word, Lord, through our response to your word, Lord, help us to just please you today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. He brought them out of darkness, the ghetto darkness, and he broke away their chains. He did the same for us. We were in darkness, darkness called sin. We were bound by chains. It may not have been a physical chain, chain but we were bound to that sin. And he broke those chains of darkness and sin for us when we accepted him as our Lord and Savior. And he broke it through a word called grace. And that's what this song talks about. The amazing grace that the Father showed us by sending his son Jesus so that we were no longer tied to those sins. And when we ask for forgiveness, through them as far as the east is from the west never to be remembered again and if the father says it that means it's so amen so let's sing about that amazing grace this morning amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me
simply come, longing just to breathe something that's a word that will bless you. much deeper with me through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I making it all about him this morning. That's what it should be. King of endless world, no one could express 
how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, Lord, all I have is yours, every single Search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made. And it's all about you. It's all about you. that when it's just between you and the Lord this morning, when there's nothing else here, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come. Morning. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come into your house this morning and just, Lord God, each and every one of us stand before you. We think about the things that we've done in the past that we're so ashamed and sad of. And yet, Lord, no matter how bad or ugly it is, when we ask for forgiveness of all of our sins, they are gone. As far as the east is from the west, it's amazing, Lord, that you can be such a loving and kind and generous God. Lord God, my prayer this morning is for each and every one of my brothers and sisters in Christ this day, that we stand before you. Let not temptation come before us, that we cannot come to you, turn to you and just seek your face and guidance in anything we say and do. Let our lives be upholding to you, Lord. Let us search out for those that are still lost in the darkness. Walk with us this week, Lord. Take care of my preacher. Forgive us all of our many sins. I ask for these things in my sweet, sweet Jesus' name. Amen.
Sorry I'm multitasking this morning. All right. Glad to be in the Lord's house today? Amen. Amen. I tell you what, last Sunday was tremendous, wasn't it? Wasn't it good to have those guys here? And I want you to know we've already invited them back next year. We might let them stay a little bit longer. Who knows? But we are glad they came. And uh, last Sunday at the, at the end, of the, at the, end of, the, of the message, when Brother Ricky was walking in, I said something that kind of threw some of y'all a curveball. I said, boy, I'm glad you can get up here and tell them the truth, because if I do that, they'll throw rocks at me. And I meant that kind of half kidding, and some of y'all took it all serious. But here's what happens. When you're the pastor, you've got to stick around. When you're an evangelist, you pop in, pop off, and pop out. And you don't have to stay around and clean up the mess. And so that's kind of what I was talking about. You know, you're an evangelist. You come in here and say anything you want to say, and then you just leave. You're on the road the next day. You don't even remember where Whitesboro, Texas was. But when you're the preacher, you've got to stick in there, hang in there, and you're with the people day in and day out. And some of y'all do throw rocks. But we'll talk about that later. But I want you to know one thing. I will always and never not tell you 100% of the truth. Always. And, 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 and God's Word can't lie. In fact, that's what Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 says. It says that God is unchangeable. It's impossible for God to lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it says we have the hope of eternal life that God who cannot lie promised before time. So not only will God not lie to you, He cannot lie. And then 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, because He can't deny Himself. So when I preach God's Word as absolute truth, that's exactly how I tend for it to be received, as absolute truth. Uh-oh, there's our problem. There's the nexus. Because truth, absolute truth, seldom lines up with what we find coming out of Washington, D.C., or Austin, Texas, or even Grayson County sometimes. But what matters is that God is truth, and Jesus is the truth. This Word is truth. And if you are offended by the truth, come see me, and I'll pray for you. In fact, I prayed the Lord Monday morning as I began to prepare this, prepare this message. I had in my plan to preach about Pilate. And that's exactly what I'm going to do today because the Lord confirmed to me that this is exactly the word we need today because what we need to hear today is about truth and half-truth and lies and being aware of the pull of culture on us as the children of God. Now, a little sidebar. If you were wondering, if you want to know, how can I discourage my pastor? If you want to know that, some of y'all lay up at night waiting, just thinking, how can I discourage my preacher? What could I say or what could I do? And, and I don't know if y'all know this or not, but October's Pastor Appreciation Month. I know we don't celebrate that much around here, and I'm not saying that, so y'all all go out and buy me a goofy card and send it to me in the mail tomorrow. But, you know, if you want to take me out to lunch today, it'd be okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> but, but we don't celebrate that much around here. But I want to tell you how you can make your pastor discouraged this month, how you can really discourage me as your pastor. You know how you can do that? You can come in here and sit and worship. You can stand up and sing. You can raise your hands and shout hallelujah. You can pray earnestly. You can listen. You can even take notes while I'm preaching. You never know the spiritual people take notes. Have you seen that there over there writing stuff down? And looking around making sure their neighbors see them writing stuff down. But you want to know how to encourage me, discourage me? You come in here, you do all that, and you walk out those doors, and it's almost like you flip a switch. And you just go back to being the way everybody else in Whitesboro, Texas are that are not saved. That's how you can discourage me as your pastor. And it happens in several ways. It might be your language. I wonder, how can you come in here and worship and praise God, and when you leave, you use some of the most awful language to talk to your wife and talk to your children, talk about the preacher? And it just doesn't make sense to me that with that same mouth, you come in here and praise God, and when you leave, you flip that switch and your language goes back to the way it was when you came in here. And I'm not the first one that thought about that. James thought about that. In James chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Praising and cursing come from the same mouth. These things should not be. And it might be that you have a particular attitude toward others. You come in here and you pretend that you understand the word joy. Say that with me, joy. joy. Spell it with me, J. Oh, why? You know what that stands for? Jesus, others, yourself. In that order. 
But when we leave here, let me tell you, it's all about you. Old Jackie, he didn't pick the right songs today, did he? I just, he could have done better. That's, that music, the sound, I don't know what Bill the board was, he must have fell asleep back there. The music was just so loud. And then when the preacher got up to preach, I couldn't even hear him. And the preacher spoke too fast at times. He spoke too low at times. It was cold in there, and the seats are uncomfortable. Let me tell you, Tuesday night we went to a volleyball game at Whitesboro High School. Let me tell you about my experience there. I pulled up in that parking lot, and granted, I was a couple minutes late to the game. I had to park so far out. You wouldn't believe how far I had to park, and I had to walk. And I walked up to that door. And you know what? There wasn't a soul at that door to open the door and welcome me when I came into the volleyball game. I had to open it myself. And then I had to walk some more. And I got up there to go in the gym. And you know what those people do at that school? They have the nerve to ask you to give money. You see where this is going, church? They, they ask for money every time you go in there. They got a lady sitting there at the desk. She's asking for money. And then when I got in the gym, oh, man, somebody was in my seat. I wanted to sit right at midcourt where I could see both sides when they swap and see everything good, and somebody was in my seat. And speaking of those seats, those are the most hard seats you'll ever sit in in your life. They don't have a back on them, and I was just uncomfortable the whole time. And let me tell you something else. Those referees did a terrible job, and those coaches, man, I could have called the plays a lot better than us. I mean, I don't know why they called those plays. And before the game starts, they played this music. At least that's what they called it. I've never heard such in my life. And the volume was so loud you couldn't even talk to the person next to you. Do you see where we're going, church? We go out of here and it becomes all about me. We're not here to worship me, are we? Who are we here to worship? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Him. So when we come together today to worship, we're here to worship. But you know, it's not just at church. You, you get outside and you flip that toxic switch and you just become negative toward everybody against you. And that, that me first attitude, it affects every area of our lives, our family, our work, our friends. And it's toxic and it's directly opposed to what the Word of God teaches us. Philippians chapter 2 says this, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. But in humility, consider others, what? Oh, wait a minute. More important than yourself. Well, we could just put that to work. And then the third way that you may go out there and flip that switch, it might be a, a critical spirit. You, you feel like you are the holiest of the holy, and you have your act together, and it's all in a bundle with a little bow tied around it, which in turn makes you have a critical spirit toward others. And some people actually believe that other people will never attain to the level of spiritual maturity that I've attained to. And you know, that's not new. They had people like that in the Bible, too. They were called Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 5, 20, I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses even that of the Pharisees and scribes, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And those are just three examples, so I hope you wrote those down if you want to discourage your pastor. Those are three examples of how you can do that. Let me remind you of this, I'm not the scorekeeper, but there is one. And you really shouldn't be too concerned about whether you can discourage or encourage your pastor if you just focus on this one thing, how can I please my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Believe me, you'd have the happiest pastor in town. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Yeah, everybody sigh. Whew, glad he's done with that. Today's message is wrapped around a particular phrase that Pilate muttered to Jesus on the night of his trial. It's almost like that famous scene which I thought about showing, but you couldn't bleep it out enough but in the movie a few good men y'all remember that movie come on a few good men tom cruise is the jag lawyer and jack nicholson is on the stand as the colonel and tom cruise knows he's got something to say but he won't say it and he won't condemn himself or indict himself and they're going on and on. And Cruz just keeps getting more and more uh, volume in his voice. And he keeps getting more and more animated. And that little vein in his forehead pops out. And he's really, he, he says, hey, I want the truth. And what does Nicholson say? You can't handle the truth. And that's kind of what Jesus told Pilate on the night of his trial. Let me give you a little background on Pilate. Pilate is the procurator, the prefect over that area. You've got to remember that 
Israel is God's set apart people. They had their own governing council called the Sanhedrin, made up of Pharisees and scribes and teachers of the law. There were 70 of them. But on civil matters, they had to go to the Roman courts, and Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor. And his policies were aimed at ridding the Romans of the Jews. We understand that by a comment that was made in Luke 13, 1. It said some people came and reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifice. Pilate actually had worshipers killed at the altar while they're offering their sacrifice and their blood mixed with the blood of their sacrifice. Let's just say there was no love lost between Pilate and the Jewish people. So with that backdrop, we read the account of Jesus before Pilate. And we focus on these words, what is truth? Stand with me as we read in John 18. And we'll begin in verse 28. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas. Caiaphas, by the way, is the head of the Sanhedrin, the high priest. To the governor's headquarters, it was early in the morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves. Otherwise, they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. Then Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man weren't a criminal, he would have handed, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. So Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. They said this so that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, signifying what kind of death he was going to die. And then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you asking this on your own, or have others told you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied, Your own nation and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom does not have its origin here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into this world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? Said Pilate. Father, help us as we look to your word today, thinking about truth. That we, O oh Father, might be able to get some application, walk out of here with two or three principles that we can put into practice this week from your word. Help us do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first thing we need to know is this. In order to hold the truth, you must first be able to handle the truth. Peanuts cartoon, the setting is the first day the kids are back at school after summer break. And the teacher has the children write an essay about returning to class. And Lucy writes in her essay this, Vacations are nice, but it's good to get back to school. There's nothing more satisfying or challenging than education, and I look forward to a year of expanding my knowledge. Needless to say, the teacher's very pleased with Lucy's essay, and she reads it proudly to the class. Charlie Brown looks on in dismay. And Lucy leans over to Charlie Brown's desk and whispers this, After a while, you learn what sells. <laughs> and what an accurate description of where we are in America today. We have learned what sells. And the great temptation is to say what others want to hear, whether we believe it or not, whether it's the truth or not. And because of this, we have come to the point where many people struggle with this idea of absolute truth. There is no black and white. They live in a multicolored, ever-changing shade of gray. And we see this great context in our text. If you look at verse 28, it says, Then they took Jesus. Who are the they there? They are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
They're the members of the great Sanhedrin. They're the ones who are trying to crucify Jesus, but they can't do it themselves because the Roman law says they can't do it. They have to take him to the Romans, and so they take him to Pilate. But notice the conflict here. They won't even go into the praetorium because if they do, they will defile themselves by being around Gentiles and they won't be able to celebrate the Passover. For them, truth on paper seemed to be different than truth in action. And we skip down to verse 38 where Pilate asked that penetrating question, what is truth? Pilate probably received training in the greatest Roman schools of judicial decorum. But he was a spiritual ant standing before the God of creation. He had no understanding of the fact that God in the flesh is standing in front of him. In his estimation, Jesus was just another problem that the Jews brought to him to ruin his day. And after he examines Jesus, he asks this important question, one that we ought to be asking ourselves today. Say it with me. What is truth? We get the idea that Jesus just stood there. Not much of a reply at all, but in effect, he had already given his reply. He was saying without talking, you've already examined me. You've already asked all these questions. You've heard the reports of what I've done, healing and leading and loving, even raising the dead. If the truth slapped you in the face, Pilate, you wouldn't recognize it. And in this period of the trials, it's not so much what Jesus says. At this point, it's what he doesn't say. Because the hidden things of God are revealed to the mature in Christ, but hidden from the carnal mind. And it was hidden from Pilate. And we find wisdom, not in a doctoral seminar on philosophy, but we find wisdom at the feet of Jesus Christ, the greatest teacher ever. So where can we find truth? What is truth? Where do we find it? Past generations have always looked to a source outside of themselves, namely God and His Word, the Bible, for determining morality and truth. But a new study from the Cultural Research Center says that 58% that, that of Americans surveyed no longer believe that God and the Bible should shape our morals and truths. Instead, they say it's up to the individual to decide what is good and what is moral. But even worse, and it's going to hurt, at least it should hurt, the same study said that evangelicals, evangelicals are those who believe this is the word of God, that salvation comes through the gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ alone. And of those kinds of people, I'm talking about us, almost as many are ready to reject moral absolute truth, 46% as the 48% who accept it means in a room like this we can split it down the middle and half don't believe God's word and God is absolutely true and half do believe. And our world right now is so confused and so divided on every issue you can imagine and it wasn't much different in Jesus' time and into that world of dysfunction and conflict Jesus spoke these words. I am the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father except by me. He was teaching that before you can handle the truth, you've got to hold the truth. And I have wonderful news for you today. Truth is not some hard to reach, almost unattainable, mystical reality that's out there somewhere. Listen carefully. This is the most important thing you're going to hear today. Truth is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. I am the way and the truth. That means wherever you find truth, folks, if you find truth in the world of accounting or business, if you find truth in the world of medical research or science, if you find truth in the world of relationships, wherever you find truth, if you find truth in the stars, you have found a person. His name is Jesus Christ. And that truth can set us free. And in sending His Son, Jesus, God gave us the opportunity to hold truth right here individually in our lives. So hang on, because in Jesus you always have the truth about the truth. And when you have the truth about the truth, well, you've got the truth. 
Secondly, the call of culture is a death sentence. Look at Pilate. He keeps looking for a way out. We know that as we read the Gospels. I find no fault. Why did you bring him to me? What's he done? What do you want me to do with this guy? He's always looking for a way out of the situation. But the lure of the crowd was too much for him. And he finally says, let me just appeal to our public and see what they want to do with him. What would you have me do with this Jesus? And what do they say? Crucify him. Crucify him. But why? What's he done? Crucify him. They shouted louder and louder and louder until all that Pilate could hear was those words, crucify him. And so he hands him over to the crowd. He says, you do it. I find no fault in him. Do with him what you will. Let me tell you something. Peer pressure doesn't end at the end of high school graduation. And Jesus reminds us that the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And as grand of an idea as it sounds like in democracy, majority rule is often not the right way to go. In fact, if you go with the majority, you're probably usually going to be wrong. Wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Joshua and Caleb found that out in the Old Testament. There were ten other spies. They were saying this. Joshua and Caleb said, no, we've got to go in. They believed that truth. They were willing to stand up against the report of the other spies because what they believed was right. In the end, it paid off for the salvation of many of God's chosen people. And you might as well accept this fact. If you're going to be true to your faith in Jesus Christ, you are going to be in the minority. The narrow way that Jesus talked about is not just an alternate way that runs alongside the broad road that leads to destruction. It's a road that's going in the complete opposite direction. And everybody is doing it is never the test of whether something is right or wrong. Amen? In fact, one, pe- one person said, everybody is doing it is probably the theme song of hell. If you march to the beat of Christ, you'll be out of step for the rest of the world. And there's always a cost involved when we make a decision. And too often, we allow the cost of our popularity to dictate the decisions that we make. Just like Pilate, when we choose to hear the call of culture over the voice of Christ, we too pay the price. And lastly, we know how this deal ends, don't we? God will ultimately win the war. As we believe, we we are opening ourselves up for God to come in and make changes in our lives. It means we become accountable to God for our decisions and for our actions. It means that as children of the King, we cannot live any longer at the moral minimum. We are called to the high standard of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But too many of us are more like Pilate than we are like Jesus. We're not willing to pay the price that's required to change our values and our morals. We're not willing to pay the price to make the right decision and follow through. Pilate, he had no clue that early morning that he was playing a very small part in a much larger drama being played out all throughout the heavens. And God used his pitiful little compromise in choosing to listen to the crowd. God was paying for your sin and for my sin. And friends, in spite of what Pilate did, God was on mission through His Son, Jesus Christ, and that mission was to pay your debt of sin and my debt of sin. And that was different than what many of us think. Many of us falsely think that the modern view of Jesus' death is that He died out of sympathy. Say that word with me, sympathy. We think Jesus died because He felt sorry for us lonely humans down here on the earth, squandering our lives away. He didn't die for sympathy. He died for identification. He died so that he could identify with our sin. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says. It says, He, God, made him, Jesus, who had no sin. You with me so far? God made Jesus who had no sin. You ready for this? To become sin for us. He made Jesus, who had no sin, 
to become sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus died not for sympathy. He died to identify himself as our sin bearer. What is truth? Truth is a person. His name is what you stand. Father in heaven, thank you that you love us enough that you always speak the truth to us. That you always give us the truth in your word and in Jesus and through your Holy Spirit that speaks to us. Sometimes, Lord, we dilly-dally with the truth like it's some toy. Father, help us above all the rest of the people in Whitesboro, Texas, to be people who always live in a manner that's true to what we profess to believe and help us speak in a manner that lives up to the one who died for me. all of the culture around us is so real and so deep and so strong and it tells us lies that if you'll just do this it won't hurt much you can ask for forgiveness later we never consider the cost of what it costs in our relationship with you Lord help us walk out of here today and refuse to flip that switch we're going to be, be the person at work or home or at play or wherever we go Monday morning. We're going to be the same person there that we are right now, sitting in your sanctuary, worshiping you. God, give us your grace to live in absolute truth. If you're here today and you have a decision to make, you want to join the church or you realize that you've never really trusted in Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. You've never given your life to Him. I want to invite you right now. Come down. Let me visit with you, pray with you, help you make a good decision this morning. Would you come as we sing? great day to be in the Lord's house. So glad to hear the word each week. Amen. All right, let's join hands across the aisle. I want to remind you that tonight is the uh, church conference at 6 p.m. in the CLC, and at 5 p.m. we have the committee meetings. Also, next Saturday night, don't forget to set your clocks back as we go into a different time change, and so you'll get to sleep an extra hour next week.
All right. Brad Park, would you just miss us in prayer?